I'm gonna share with you my top 10 weathering tips for beginners coming up on JC's Rip Track. Hi there, my name is John and welcome to JC's Rip Track. If this is your first time here and you're looking for advice and tips on how to transform your plastic models into something that looks like it belongs on the rails today, then please hit subscribe and that little bell icon that appears beside it so that you can be notified anytime that I release a new video. So what is the best piece of advice that you've had when it comes to weathering? Let me know in the comments section down below. Not too long ago, I received a comment that kind of stuck with me, that sometimes, especially for someone who is just starting out with weathering, looking at the stuff that people like Ralph Renzetti, Rob Arsenault, Jeremy St. Peter, or even myself can do can be pretty intimidating. And for that, I need to apologize. The whole reason that I started this channel was to provide some tips and advice on how to do weathering for people like you and show that it's not magic, that there are some neat and quick ways to get some very realistic results that will look great on your layout or your shelf. But really, this is about your model railroad, your dioramas, or whatever it is that you're working on. So with that in mind, I wanted to share with you 10 tips that will work for you, whether you're looking to get into weathering, you're just starting out, or you've been doing it for a while and want to up your game. My first tip is simply this, start weathering. Seriously, you're not gonna get any weathering done if you don't sit down and actually give it a try. But this is harder than it seems. There can be any number of reasons why we don't get started, and many of them are understandable. It can be an issue of time and priority, but it can also stem from simply not knowing where to start or being overwhelmed by all the advice that's out there, whether it's good or bad. And yes, I do appreciate the irony of this whole channel on that last point. But here's a few pointers on how to get started aside from watching my Where Do I Start video. Start on a model that doesn't matter. Like many of us, you may have a reasonable amount of rolling stock that you've acquired. Some of it will be higher end stuff and some of it won't be. And you already know what that is and it's the lower end stuff that you start with. That way you can build up your confidence on your cheap rolling stock before getting into something a bit pricier. Another bit of advice that I can give is dive into a bargain bin. Pick up stuff from a flea market. These are great sources for inexpensive models that you can practice your process and techniques on. Not only that, you may even find that old rail car that was once consigned to a dustbin may turn into a potential centerpiece for your layout. That happened to me with these two gondola cars that I entered into the Down and Dirty Weathering Contest last year. I literally found them loose in a cardboard box on the bottom shelf at my local hobby shop. No jewel box, nothing to otherwise protect them. And after I finish weathering them, I take whatever chance I get to put them front and center. So if you remember nothing else, start. Get a model and weather it. But here's a few more tips to help you along the way. As you're getting started, do some research. For this, I don't mean watch YouTube videos on how to weather stuff. You're already doing that now. What I mean is you can do research on weathering stuff just by looking at the back end of a big truck sitting in that traffic jam on your way home from work. We are surrounded by stuff that is dirty, dusty, rusty, beaten up, and otherwise at the mercy of the elements. You can literally do research for weathering by getting out of the house and looking around. So with that in mind, pay attention to how stuff around you is weathered. Do rail fanning. Go take pictures of the rusted car in your neighbor's driveway. Look at dump trucks, construction equipment, old houses, aging brick buildings, all of it. A chipped and rusted fire hydrant on your street can give you ideas on how the colors of rust work. That being said, there are a lot of resources out there. Check out some of the dedicated weathering and modeling groups on Facebook or the internet in general. There's also several great book resources out there too from very experienced modelers, but remember, we all have to start somewhere. Now weathering, like many parts of model railroading or modeling in general, is an art form. Art tells a story, and the weathering process tells the story of that particular car or locomotive. Every scratch, patch, dent, ding, rust streak, graffiti tag, and mud splash has a story to how it got there on the model. Think of weathering as weaving together a narrative, and every car, locomotive, or structure has its own tale to tell. 
For many in model railroading, one major piece of it is sharing the history or specifically the story of a given railroad in a given place. It's more than just dates or times, but it is embracing the story. Use that to your advantage. Weathering is one way that you can easily get into the living history of your layout. So as you're getting ready to put your brush to the model, try to think of it as a story. Imagine workers scrambling up and down ladders, wearing away the paint with their steel-toed boots. Think of the gravel and debris that is kicked up from the ballast and chipping away at the paint as the car rumbles down the line. Think of the driving rain, the blazing sun, the howling wind that leave their mark. Think of all the different places this car has visited and the dents and the scratches that it picks up along the way. In telling the story of the piece, it will help you with my next tip. Now this next tip may not be that obvious, but it is really helpful. Develop a process that works for you. Techniques are fine, but the process of weathering is more important than what you do at each step. For example, if you're looking at adding decals, it is a really good idea to put them early in the process before you start doing some of the weathering, unless you're adding something over top of a patch. Knowing when in the workflow a technique works best can go a long way in easing some anxieties. My weathering basics videos that started this channel were primarily about the process of weathering because individual techniques can be plugged in and swapped out at every step. Not only that, by understanding weathering as a process and becoming more comfortable with it, you can then adjust it to tell the story of the model that you're working on. Like process, this tip is not an obvious one. Know why you're using a given technique. Quite often, the three bits of advice that I've seen for weathering is using an ink or isopropyl alcohol wash, spraying everything with dull coat, or getting weathering powders or chalks. These aren't necessarily bad pieces of advice. After all, model railroaders have been using these tricks for years. But it's only been a few places that really answer the question, why? So why use an ink wash? Why use chalk? Why spray stuff with dull coat? Even the techniques that I've suggested, like dot fading, pin washes, or using a sponge, knowing why is important. You see, I can quickly explain that dot fading creates an uneven, worn look on a surface. Pin washes are intended to make details pop, and sponge painting can create a more natural look of scraped and chipped paint. Answer the question why, and then it starts to make more sense. Always use more than one technique. No one trick is going to instantly transform a clean factory fresh model into a weathered masterpiece. It is a diversity of techniques when combined together that will create something that will transform that plastic model into a veteran of the rails. For example, if I were trying to replicate this rusty texture from the side of a black car, I would need to use at least three to four different techniques linked together. In the same way, getting the grimy sides on this covered hopper was a combination of pan pastels further enhanced with some oil paints. Combining techniques together into a process is what really creates a convincing result. Look at the techniques and processes of modelers from other genres. Look at what they're doing because processes and techniques are transferable when it comes to painting and weathering models of any kind. Much of my own formative years in painting was in the realm of fantasy and science fiction war games. There's a particular style and form that is prevalent in that particular genre that makes it distinct. It tends to lean towards a three-dimensional comic art. And still, when I was in the midst of that, I wanted to learn how to create highly realistic rust effects because the orc army that I was painting were very ramshackle in nature. Even then, I mostly kept inside my own silo, and I only occasionally peered over the edge into what other modelers were doing. It wasn't until a little over 10 years ago, when a particular book was published, that deliberately pushed the boundaries, taking models that were firmly within Warhammer 40,000 and using the techniques of scale armor modelers to create some absolutely fantastic results. One of the artists that created the book was the pioneer of the now famous hairspray technique. This book, called Imperial Armor Model Masterclass, fundamentally changed the way that I paint, but it also broadened my horizons to the point that now I'm always looking at what modelers from all kinds of genres are doing to up their game. 
but I didn't leave the wargaming techniques behind. In fact, all this did was expand my arsenal and it gave me a great appreciation for the artistry across so many different genres. By getting outside of my own comfort zone, it pushed me to up my game. I bring my miniature painting skill set in painting passengers for this upcoming passenger car project. And sometimes it's even good to get outside one's own scale. Sometime in the next few months, I'm going to be working on this particular model as a change of scenery. Before weathering an expensive model, it's often a good idea to test it out. Whether you use a test card or an inexpensive model, get familiar with the technique or the series of techniques first and then get some practice under your belt. Notice that I said get familiar. I didn't say get comfortable because if you wait until you're comfortable with it, you will never use it. And this goes back to the first point, just get started. Still, testing something out can give you an idea on how it will work as you apply it to a model. As I mentioned in the first point, you can test stuff out on bargain bin models, but pieces of plastic card or plastic cutlery can give you a quick idea on how a particular technique is going to work. Use the best tool or material for the job. Several people have asked me if they can use the dot fade technique using acrylic paints. Well, yes you can, but by the time that you mix the paints with the right blenders and retarding mediums, you could have done the dot fading with oils on several models and spent less money on it. Oils have certain qualities around blending that acrylic paints just don't have. In a similar way, acrylic paints have qualities that oils don't. The techniques that we use with each type of paint play to their strength of that material. Similarly, it is a good idea to invest in decent quality materials. For example, craft paints have their place, particularly in scenery, but they normally aren't the best thing for weathering. Unless, of course, you're using a technique that relies on the thinner nature of craft paints, and there actually is one. But for the most part, invest in decent quality paints and brushes and you won't regret it. When it comes to dedicated weathering products, there's a couple points that I should make. These were created by modelers for modelers. They're not magic wands, but they do give consistent, reproducible results. Yes, you can make your own pin washes with oil paints and thinner, but a pre-mixed wash saves you time and will be consistent each time you use it. However, you will need to try it out and practice with it in order to get the results that you're looking for. My next point goes back to the first. Just get to your workbench and give it a try. Just that alone starts a cycle of learning where we can evaluate what we've done, figure out what works and what doesn't, and you can carry it further in sharing it with others. There's no such thing as a failed project if we learn from it. There is such a thing, however, as spending too much time trying to nail down the perfect technique or trying to buy that one thing that will do it all. Just like weathering itself, learning how to weathering models is a process. Reading and research needs to be put into practice without worrying about whether or not you will get it perfect the first time or even the 100th time. Every time we sit down to do it, we learn something new. In my conversations with many of you, I've learned a great deal along the way, both from experienced modelers as well as eager beginners. Perhaps the last little bit of advice that I should give is not everything should end up looking like a rust bucket. A good rule to remember, especially when you're starting out, is less is more. Remember, the point of weathering is not to make a small model look dirty. The point of weathering is to make a small model look big. So I do hope you found this helpful. And if you want more tips on how to get the most out of your weathering and painting projects, don't forget to hit subscribe and that little bell icon so you won't miss any upcoming videos. Also, if you haven't already, check out the other videos on this channel, as well as some of the social media links down below. Check out my Patreon to see how you can become involved in the creative process for this channel. And so thanks so much for watching. Good luck, and may you keep on track.